Recording has started. Can everybody see a yellow square? Yes. Okay, great. Well, all right, so then, yeah, so good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, today's edition of the Point Distribution Webinar. Today, we have speaking Matthew DeCourcy Ireland from uh, EPFL, talking about Lubotsky Philip Sarnock points on a sphere. Thanks, Ryan. And uh, thanks to the uh, organizers for making this happen. Uh, it's been great uh, not only to learn math, but also just to feel connected. So thank you very much uh, for the whole webinar and thanks for having me. So uh, I'm not talking about my own work. I'm talking about work of Lubotsky Philip Sarnak, who found a very interesting uh, way to put points on a sphere that I hope you'll enjoy. So this is work from the 80s. They construct points on a sphere by writing a prime number as a sum of four squares, integer squares. Another thing you could do is try to write numbers as a sum of three squares, and then you would literally have a point on a sphere of some radius that you could rescale to the unit sphere. That's also very interesting. It turns out those points behave uh, very close to random points. This four square construction uh, has a lot of structure that works out quite differently. So why four squares? If you're only on a two dimensional sphere, uh, the connection is with quaternions. Each uh, vector of A, B, C, D in this representation gives you a quaternion, which acts on the sphere by rotation so from several such quaternions, you're going to get several such points. And, and that's roughly how the construction goes. Uh, the proof that those points are well distributed uses some serious input. That's the Ramanujan conjecture proved by Deling. And the fact that their properties are best possible uh, relies on another input, a theorem of Keston concerning random walks on groups. So I'll indicate only very briefly uh, how, how those uh, inputs come into play. By the way, please uh, ask any questions you have along the way. Uh, I can't see the chat right now, but uh, I can hear you, I hope. Is there a specific definition of well-distributed we're using here or just a general gist of it? There is a specific uh, sense in which these points are optimal uh, that we'll get to. So the sense is related to quadrature. Uh, given a set of points on the sphere, uh, you could evaluate a function at those points and add it up as some approximation to the integral of the function. So we introduce this operator TF its value at x is the sum of f of all these rotated points. The s inverse instead of s is not essential. That's just to make this act on right as opposed to left or the other way around. And in this case, it really doesn't matter because I'm assuming the set is symmetric. So the sum would on the nose be the same if you just replaced each rotation with its inverse. Uh, the reason to do it symmetrically is to make this operator self-adjoint. So then you can try to study its spectrum profitably. The largest eigenvalue is what you get for the constant function. If you have two L rotations, an even number because of this pairing with the inverses, then obviously the constant function will just return two L times the constant. And you can see that that's the largest eigenvalue because this operator is a sum of two L unitary operators. So if they all have norm one, 
there's no way to get eigenvalues bigger than the number of terms. So the constant function gives you 2L, and if you're orthogonal to the constant, so the integral of the function is zero, then TF should be small because we want TF evaluated at some point to be close to the integral of F. So the goal here is to make it small. So this is not possible on the torus. There's a special feature of the sphere at play here. On the torus, instead of rotations, we would have translations. So let's say we translate by plus or minus some number AI. Again, I'm always including inverses with each operation. For the same reason as before, the constant function will give you 2L, just the number of operations. And the key point is that there are exponentials with eigenvalue arbitrarily close to 2L. So it's not true that this operator will be small when the integral is small because the exponential integrates to zero, but the result of, of this operation is going to be almost as big as for the constant function one. Uh, so to see why, uh, let's represent the torus concretely as just a quotient by integer lattice. Then you have exponentials uh, where the frequency is any integer vector That'll be well defined on the torus by periodicity. And then if you evaluate this exponential at x plus or minus ai, Euler's identity kicks in. You're gonna get e to the square root minus one ai, sorry about the double i's, plus uh, e to the minus that. So you get cosine. So the eigenvalue for this f is twice the sum of the cosines of all of these uh, dot products of the, of the frequency we chose with the given translations ai. And you could choose the frequency nu to make all of those dot products very close to integers. For instance, just choose most of the co coordinates to be zero and then take a reasonably good rational approximation to one of the ais then all of these will be very close to rational. Cosine of two pi times very close to rational will be very close to one, and the sum will be very close to two L. As close as you want by taking a suitable frequency. So on the torus, there is no such spectral gap. You cannot make the operator small just because the integral of the function is zero. So maybe it's useful to compare this with another problem like spherical designs. With a spherical design, you demand exact integration for polynomials of low degree up to some, some fixed point. And then there's no requirement beyond that point, but it has to be exact for functions of low complexity. Whereas in this setting, we're making an approximation. Nobody is asking for exact integration here, uh, but whatever you get, it has to work for all functions. So these new that, that appear in, in the counter example, they're going to be very large if you wanna make the rational approximation very good. So the function has very high complexity and that is still an obstacle in this problem. In a way it would not be in some other settings. So this is one thing that's specific to the sphere compared to other geometries. And what's specific about the two dimensional sphere is a special way of representing rotations in three dimensions that doesn't apply as simply in any other case. So just to recap, 
this is the sense of, of uh, good distribution that we're aiming for. Lambda one is the next eigenvalue after what you get for the constant function. So you get 2L for the constant function if you have 2L rotations. And then lambda one is the biggest that you can make TF in L2 norm over all functions orthogonal to the constant and normalized in L2. So it's the L2 to L2 operator norm restricted to non-constant functions. So this controls the mean square error when you try to use this scheme to approximate integrals, mean over different choices of x. So you choose a point, and then you have these rotations that give you the rest of the configuration. And the goal is to make lambda 1 as far from 2L as possible. So if there are no questions about that, where we're going next is to talk about quaternions and how they represent rotations in 3D. Are there any questions before we do that? I'll take that as a no. So this is a plaque that you can find on a bridge in Dublin. Here as he walked by on the 16th of October, 1843, Sir William Rowan Hamilton in a flash of genius discovered the fundamental formula for quaternion multiplication. I squared equals J squared equals K squared equals IJK equals minus one and cut it on a stone of this bridge. So here I've drawn the basic quaternions, one i, j, k, and their negatives. There are eight of them, but I've tried to draw it as a cube in perspective. So plus and minus one are both in the center, like they're in the center of the group. So what happens here is that you have h vertices, i, j, k, minus i, minus j, minus k, and plus minus one. And at each of them, you can multiply by i, j, k, or their inverses, which are also their negatives. So again, because of the perspective, you don't see six lines at most of the points. But maybe you can see this arrow here. So from let's say one, I can multiply by i, I can multiply by minus i, I can multiply by j, minus j. So at each point of the cube, you have this. So these are the basic quaternions, and then you can take linear combinations. And the key point here is that that's an algebra, much like the complex numbers, it's associative, division works. Uh, the only catch is that it's not uh, commutative anymore because i times j is equal to minus j times i, for example. And uh, this relation ijk equals minus one is kind of a right-hand rule uh, built into these. So maybe you can already see the rotations coming in. So a quaternion is just any linear combination of one, i, j, k, and such a sum has a conjugate where you keep the real part the same, but you change the sign of the i, j, k parts, just like complex numbers. Again, just like complex numbers, you have a norm. Crucially, the norm is multiplicative. Uh, so that means, among other things, division works. For any quaternion that's not zero, its conjugate divided by its norm and serves as an inverse. 
another consequence of the fact that it's multiplicative is that uh, conjugating doesn't change the norm. If I have some middle quaternion R and I act on both sides by Q and Q inverse, the norm stays the same. I see a more. Is there a question? No, is there slides? Nope. So the key point here is that if the middle quaternion R has real part zero, then so does Q inverse RQ. It preserves that hyperplane. Uh, to make life easy, if you're thinking of checking that, notice that it's linear with respect to R. So it's enough to just check for I, J, and K separately. And by symmetry, if you believe one of those cases, then you should believe the other two. So that uh, limits the amount of work you have to do to check this. So it preserves this, uh, this plane where, where W equals zero. And it also preserves the norm of the quaternion. So in other words, uh, we have an orthogonal transformation on the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one. So in this way, each quaternion defines a rotation of the sphere. Which rotation is it? Uh, is easy to see in polar coordinates. So much like for complex numbers, uh, you can write a quaternion as uh, some scalar, positive if you like, times cos theta plus u sine theta. Over the complex numbers, u would just be i, but over the quaternions, uh, u could be any square root of minus one. So you have, uh, you have a sphere of choices there. And what you can check is that conjugation by that quaternion is a rotation around the axis u, uh, and the angle gets doubled. Uh, so that's something you can check uh, by considering another vector orthogonal to the axis and doing the multiplication. Uh, as a sanity check, uh, you could also verify it in a, a simple case like q equal to i, where uh, the action on one of the other unit quaternions is going to say send j to minus j. So even though i only has angle pi over 2, it's rotating by angle pi. So it checks out in that case. And it's also related to the fact that in, in 3D, uh, you kind of have a choice, right? Whether you're, whether you're going clockwise by theta or counterclockwise by, by 2 pi minus theta. So you can always sort of take minus u instead of u for the same axis. And it's important that the angle gets doubled because then those, those will be the same rotation. So you can read off directly from the quaternion, once you write it in polar coordinates, uh, the axis and the angle are just given to you by the form, which is very much not the case for an orthogonal three by three matrix. If you diagonalize, then you can figure everything out. Uh, but in general, what, what you know, the rotation is one zero zero for the axis, and then some two by two rotation matrix. But to bring it into that form, you have to change basis. So once you do all the multiplication, the axis and the angle are just completely obscured. Whereas in the quaternion form, uh, you can read them off. I saw a little thing get highlighted. Is there a question? Hey, Matthew, yeah, I have a question. So what is S? Is it independent on nu and theta? Yeah, S is a scalar. It's uh, the norm of the quaternion, or maybe square root of the norm. OK, 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 all right. It's just a normalization constant, say, something like that. Exactly. In terms okay. of uh, the rotation, It'll just cancel out between Q inverse and Q. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. 
Thank you for the question. Any other questions? So this is how quaternions uh, represent rotations. It's very convenient and it's widely used. So here's an example. Take the prime P equal to five. Five is the norm of any quaternion of this shape. 1 plus 2i, 1 plus 2j, 1 plus uh, 2k. Those all have norm 5. You could also change the 1 to a minus 1, but at that point it becomes redundant because you're just flipping the axis. So it's really just these, uh, these 6 that matter. So in the polar form, the norm is 5, so the scalar will be square root of 5. Uh, the theta you choose has to have this cosine, cosine theta equals one on root five, just in order to make root five times that be one. And then u will either be i, j, k, or their negatives, depending on which of the six you started from. So what's the axis of such a rotation? We just read it off, it's u. So depending on which choice you made, you either get the x-axis, the y-axis, or the z-axis, three orthogonal axes. And the inverse of a rotation always comes with the rotation uh, that's just built in by this choice of signs here. So the only trick is this doubling of the angle. You have to use some trig identity to figure out what uh, the actual angle of rotation is. And because cos theta is one over root five, Trigonometry tells us that uh, doubling the angle will lead to arc cos of minus three fifths, which is a little less than 127 degrees out of a full circle of 360 degrees. Uh, there's no good reason that I included this many decimal places. I just copy pasted this from my calculator. But it is important to note that this uh, angle is not a rational multiple of pi or not a rational multiple of 360 degrees. Um, that means that if you do these rotations again and again, you'll get points that mix very rapidly on the sphere. Whereas if this angle were pi over four or something, you know, there could be relations. So this is my attempt to bring you to me, even if we can't be together. This is part of a mural uh, at the metro station near EPFL. They included all sorts of formulas. And a lot of them uh, are essentially definitions. They don't really express anything. Uh, but this one does. Uh, it says that pi three of S2 is isomorphic to the group of integers. So there is a non-trivial map from the three sphere to the two sphere and any map from three sphere to two sphere is homotopic to some number of this ones chained together. It generates the whole group. And what that map is, is quaternion rotations. So the three sphere consists of all of the unit quaternions, you know, just all the points in R4 whose sum of squares is one, that's the three sphere. But if you think of them as quaternions, then you have a map to the two sphere where you fix any points, the North Pole, for example, and then you rotate by the given quaternion. So that'll bring you to some other point on the two sphere. So you get a map three sphere to two sphere. Uh, that's the Hopf map. And I'm very happy that they put it on this mural.
So the key ingredient in this construction, how it gets off the ground, is writing a prime number as a sum of four squares. So we need to understand uh, how that can be done, how many ways there are to do it. And the answer is hp plus one. Uh, it turns out that's true for all primes p. The construction of lubotsky phillips sarnak is already extremely interesting for p equal to five. Uh, so from that point of view, uh, there's not really any reason to discuss the proof of the general 8p plus 1 here, given the time constraints. So here are several examples just showing how the simple combinatorics works out to 8p plus 1 in a few examples. So for p equal to 5, which again I emphasize is uh, the case to keep in mind if you're looking for one to keep in mind, all you can really do is 5 equals 1 plus 4. And then there are just a bunch of trivial ways to rewrite that. So you've got 1, 2, 0, 0 as, your, as the numbers that you square. You can choose which of the coordinates get 0. That gives you six ways from, from four, choose two. And then you can choose which of the leftover coordinates is one and which is two. So that's another factor of two. And then you choose the signs. That doesn't change the sum of squares. So you can change one to minus one, two to minus two. For any non-zero coordinate, that'll introduce another factor of two. So in this case, that works out to 48, which is indeed hp plus 1 when p is 5. So I've included 7 and 11 on this slide as well. Uh, I don't know, just as further evidence, further examples. It does work out a little bit differently for 1 mod 4 versus 3 mod 4, so it's worth uh, taking note of 7. In that case, you don't have any zeros, so it, it's more a question of where do you put the special coordinate and then choosing the signs. Again, the answer is 8p plus 1. So in all of these first three cases, there's really only one way to do it, up to permutations and sign changes. The first really non-unique case is p equal to 13. In that case, you've got uh, 3, 2, 0, 0, and 1, 2, 2, 2. So two different ways, together with their whole train of variations. Um, so one of them is just double zeros. It works out the same as p equal to 5, so you get 48. Uh, the other one works out the same uh, combinatorially as p equal to 7. So you put those together, and, and again, the answer is 8p plus 1. Uh, so that's how it goes uh, in very concrete terms. Jacobi proved that that's always the case. Uh, no matter the prime p, the number of ways to write it as a sum of four squares is always 8p plus 1. Uh, there's a little annoyance when you try to do composite numbers, which is that the multiples of 4 count differently. There's a little bit of an even versus odd thing that kicks in. Uh, so that's one reason that this, this construction is uh, only stated for primes. You would get something more complicated if you tried to generalize it. So one thing you might notice from the previous examples is that you always have one special coordinate. It's either odd and the others are even, or it's even and the others are odd. Which of those two alternatives uh, occurs depends on whether the prime is 1 or 3 mod 4. And 1 mod 4 is the simpler case. Um, in that case, you get one odd and the other's even. So that means you can choose a representation where the scalar part is odd and the other's even. So mod 2, the quaternion is just 1. In the opposite case, when the prime is 3 mod 4, it's a little bit tricky. You have an even one for one of the coordinates and odd for the others. So instead of 1 mod 2, you get i plus j plus k mod 2. Uh, so in either case, there is a standard form, 
which cuts down all of these sign changes and permutations you can do. But it's easier when p is 1 mod 4, so that's the case uh, that we'll assume we're in from now on. So from 8p plus 1, we get p plus 1, basically by the action of that cube, the 1, i, j, k, and their negatives. If you multiply by one of those, you don't change the norm of the quaternion. So those are all included. And that's basically the factor of eight. By choosing the right one, you could make whichever coordinate you like be positive and special, either odd or even. So we will make that choice. We'll make the first one, the real one, the real part, scalar part W be positive and when p is 1 mod 4, it'll be the one that's odd. So for each prime p, you get p plus 1 quaternions, hence rotations. Just like for p equal to 5, we got 6. There was, there was redundancy in including the other ones, which give the same rotations. So Jacobi assures us that this always happens. And uh, this is just a comment to clarify a little bit how quaternion arithmetic becomes easier if you allow some denominators. So the Hurwitz quaternions either have all coefficients integers or all of them half integers. So in other words, you're allowed 1 plus i plus j plus k quantity over 2 in addition to i, j, k, and all their linear combinations. So either all integer or all half integer. So in terms of lattices, instead of the integer lattice, z to the 4, uh, you now kind of have two separate layers, and you get d4. And this turns out to be a great success, because if you try to divide one quaternion with another with a remainder, Sometimes you're sort of exactly in the middle of one of the cubes from Z4. Um, so you, you have some choice in, in which, which point to do. So if you allow these extra points with all half integers, uh, then you actually enable division with remainder and unique factorization. So this is why we don't include the multiples of four uh, for composite n, somehow those are coming from Horvitz quaternions that are not integral quaternions. So why does this achieve lambda 1 equal to 2 root p? That's the claim here that lubotsky phillips sarnak proved. For each prime p, let's say 1 mod 4, you get p plus 1 rotations. And the claim is that there is a spectral gap. Instead of uh, 2L, or essentially P, for the top eigenvalue, they prove that the next one is only square root of P. So much smaller if P is large. But even for small P, like 2, numerically, that this is a spectral gap. So th the method of the proof is to suppose that there's a difference between lambda 1 and 2 root p and amplify it. If you have a little bit of a difference after one move, rotating by one quaternion among these, p plus 1, imagine how much bigger the difference will be if you take many steps. The errors will add up. Uh, so they're going to iterate this. So if you take a bunch of quaternions of norm p and multiply them together, taking many steps, so to speak, the norm of the product will be a power of p. Uh, so they introduce uh, generalizations of this t operator where you don't just take the sum over the basic rotations, but, but you also take a sum over longer products. So let's say all quaternions with norm n instead of norm p. 
And we're still assuming this standard form where the quaternion has real part odd instead of one of the other components. Uh, so the lemma is a relation between taking m steps and just the basic set inductively. How do you express that? So the form of it is that after p to the m steps, the operator you get is a polynomial in the basic operator t for those p plus 1 rotations. And in fact, it's a Chebyshev polynomial, the second kind, the one for sine instead of cos, and possibly also with some normalization by p. Uh, But the takeaway here is that it's an explicit polynomial. After m steps, you get sine of m plus 1 theta over sine theta times this p to the m over 2. Uh, so I'll say a little bit more about where that comes from. But first, let's see what it implies about the gap. So in order to use this uh, sort of trig identity effectively, obviously we want to write uh, things trigonometrically. So lambda is 2 root p cos theta. Now, if theta were real, then cos theta would be between minus 1 and 1. So that would be great. So that would show that lambda 1 in absolute value is 2 root p, maybe even less. In fact, it'll really be 2 root p. Uh, but if theta were complex, then the inequality would fail. And a priori, to do this change of variable, we need to allow complex theta because we don't yet know that lambda is less than 2 root p, an absolute value. So this is just a change of variable. It uh, transforms the problem into showing that theta is real instead of showing that lambda lies in a certain interval. So again, we write the eigenvalue as 2 root p cos theta, and we uh, assume that we have an eigenfunction. So I've written it as u, and there's a step I haven't written here, which is decomposing L2 into spherical harmonics. So you can do this proof degree by degree. You have an orthogonal decomposition on which t acts. So it's enough to prove this for spherical harmonics of each fixed degree. If you can establish the gap for all degrees, then you'll have the same result for arbitrary L2 functions. So u is a spherical harmonic. It's an eigenfunction for t. The eigenvalue is 2 root p cos theta. And we have this lemma relating p to p to the n. It says that after m steps, the action is given by this Chebyshev polynomial, sine m plus 1 theta over sine theta, normalized by p to the m over 2. Uh, so this is where Deligne comes in to bail us out. There's an input here for any harmonic and any point on the sphere. Remember, t of u is, t is an operator, t u is a function. We still have to evaluate it at some point. And what Deligne tells us is that no matter what point, no matter what harmonic, you always have this bound. And you should think of this as a bound for very large m, taking a very large number of steps, starting from a fixed p, fixed harmonic, fixed point, the variable here is the number of steps, how many rotations in a row you're allowed to apply. So the estimate depends on all of those parameters, but not on the number of steps m. So as the number of steps grows, we have a comparison here. There's this factor p to the m over 2 that just cancels out and shows that what's left, p to the epsilon m, 
has to be larger up to a constant than this Chebyshev factor, sine m plus one theta over sine theta. But as m grows, uh, that has a very clear behavior. Sine is just imaginary exponential. So if you take that to the m plus one and cancel out another one from sine theta in the denominator, this will grow like e to the m imaginary part of theta. So on the one hand, we have an exponential rate epsilon times log p, but think of p as fixed. On the other, we have an exponential rate of the imaginary part of theta. And epsilon can be as small as we want. That's the input from Deligne, as small as you want. There will be a constant depending on epsilon so that the estimate holds. So this is only possible if theta is real. And quantitatively, if you didn't know this for all epsilon, if Deligne weren't here to save the day, you would still get something where as small, you know, whatever epsilon you can prove, we would still be able to bound the imaginary part of theta somehow by inverting this change of variables. But fortunately, Deligne is here to save the day and we get the optimal result that theta is real, not just in some strip. Uh, any questions about this? This is probably one of the denser slides. I'll move on. So I don't really want to explain in detail uh, this passage from P to P to the M. Uh, the key idea is uh, writing a quaternion of norm P to the M as a product of quaternions with smaller norm. So it's a fact that every integral quaternion of that norm P to the M can be represented as a product of, well, it could be m quaternions of norm p, that would certainly give p to the m. But the other thing you can do is have an overall scalar p to the s together with a smaller number of individual quaternions of norm p. So you have many such forms. For each s and t, you can, you can choose what scalar p to the s to put and how many t to put. And as long as 2s plus t equals m, that will have norm p to the m. And the other thing you can do is, is change the sign. That won't change the norm either. So these are all the ways that you can express quaternions of norm p to the m. And using that, you can write the operator t p to the m as a sum. So it's a sum over s. Again, you, you can choose any s. Could be 0, could be anything as high as m over 2. So you express the operator as a sum like that, and that gives you a recurrence, where you, either in one shot, you could just sort of relate p to the m directly to p, or you could think of comparing p to the m to the adjacent shell, p to the m minus 1. In any case, there's some recurrence that comes from the tree. So here, I've again chosen p equal to 5. So for your first move, you have p plus 1 choices. It could be any of, of the basic quaternions in our set. And then at each step after that, uh, you have p choices, one less, because you're not allowed to backtrack. I mean, you could if you wanted to, but it, but it wouldn't give anything new. So that's the counting that you have to do. There's this tree. It gives you a recurrence for which polynomial uh, gm 
gives you operator t p to the m equal to that polynomial in t p there's a two-step recurrence it's linear there's a complicated dependence on x because it's a polynomial but in terms of the number of steps it's just a linear recurrence with two steps so you can solve it by exponentials you know you find the the eigenvalues of this recursion so you get some exponentials and when you match the initial values it turns out that it's exactly the Chebyshev polynomial uh, so that that's where it comes from and uh, that's all the detail I intended to say unless there are questions So, so in this second summation again, uh, what is uh, uh, how do you choose W? W is one of the p options. Is that right? Yeah, good question. W is a word. So in this representation of beta, we have plus or minus scalar times product of t quaternions. W is that product. It's uh, all the possible words. You know, just the string of of symbols you would write in order to do that product. Yeah. Yeah, so essentially in this tree, um, S is how many steps you've gone in the tree, and uh, W is which word you're actually doing of that length. Okay. It's not exactly that length. It's not length S, it's length T, where T is the complementary thing to make them add up to N. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So uh, some more details that I will elide. Uh, we're trying to estimate uh, the operator applied to some u, so we use a generating function, uh, an exponential generating function of this form, theta of z, where you sum over all quaternions. In this case, uh, the norm will be 2 mod 4. That's supposed to be the same as the standard form we've assumed where the quaternion is one mod two, right? It just has like odd real part, even other parts. But again, there, there's some parity issue that comes up and uh, we're actually going to rescale by two. So it's a sum over integral quaternions up to this congruence of a polynomial that includes two things. It includes both the given harmonic as well as the norm of the quaternion to the appropriate power, m. Again, we're doing p to the m here. And then times z is this variable for the generating series. So you can define it that way as a sum over quaternions, or you can collect terms, regroup the quaternions that all have the same norm, and then you get this other expression. And that expression is good for us because now these coefficients are very closely related to what we were trying to bound. It's just, it's basically the operator T applied to U because we're summing U over all the basic quaternions of norm nu and this congruence. Again, there, there's a rescaling that happens, but uh, this is the key, uh, the key technical tool, this generating function. Uh, if we can bound the coefficients of this function, then uh, we'll have the inputs that we used earlier. So this is much like the standard theta series of a lattice, except it's twisted by a polynomial. So the key input here is that that sum, the sum of u over all the quaternions of norm nu, satisfying this congruence, uh, is at most nu to the half plus any epsilon you want, as small as you want. 
And this is true for any non-constant spherical harmonic U. Uh, technically, what happens is that the theta series from the previous slide is a holomorphic cusp form of weight 2 plus 2m for the group gamma 4. Uh, I'm not going into that, but what it means roughly is that theta is periodic under some translations. That comes directly from the series because the exponential is, is already periodic. Uh, but there's also uh, some more subtle properties that you get by applying Poisson summation to this sum over all the integral quaternions with some condition. You're summing over a lattice and Poisson summation gives you another symmetry there. Uh, the key condition that would fail if the harmonic were constant is sort of a growth condition that it's not too large uh, in either regime when the imaginary part of the variable is very small or very large. So those are roughly the things that need to be checked. And Deligne's theorem is that for any function satisfying those things of weight k, again, the, the, the weight k is what enters in this more detailed thing you get from Poisson summation. In our case, it's going to be 2 plus 2m, where m is the number of steps. But what Deligne assures us is that the Newth coefficient in this series is at most nu to the k over 2 minus a half, plus a very small error that you can make as small as you want if you need to. So for this generating function, the coefficients are nu to the m times the sum basically tu, sum over quaternions of u, and the weight is 2 plus 2m. So directly from Deligne, you get this claim that you can upper bound that by nu to the half plus epsilon, because the nu to the m just cancels out with the weight, except there's this extra 2. You divide by 2, you subtract a half, you get uh, the titular claim of that slide. Uh, so again, uh, I'm not aiming for details here, but this is roughly what the input is. So again, there's this factor of two that we need to account for. Because of this feature of quaternions, you have another factor of two and you're not quite applying to Ling uh, to the p to the nth coefficient. You're applying it to the four p to the nth coefficient. Uh, that's certainly not uh, the takeaway that I want you to have from this. The takeaway is that de Ling saves the day by directly applying his theorem. The estimate we need follows. Uh, so very quickly, why can't we do even better? And that's where Keston comes into this. So uh, there's a concept here, the Cayley graph, uh, which is a geometrical way to represent a group. You're given a group with some set of elements, finitely many. You assume that they generate the group. And then you write that as a graph. The vertices are the elements of the group. The edges connect each element to the product of that element with the generators. So in our case, uh, there's, a finite, there's a group of rotations, finitely generated group. The generators are these p plus one special quaternions, and then you're applying one after another. So on any graph, you have an adjacency operator, essentially the same as this operator T we had earlier, where you sum over all the neighbors of the vertex. So that's the general setup. Uh, if you're worried that you've never seen Cayley graphs before, I promise you've seen at least one uh, roughly 40 minutes ago. It's this cube of quaternions. It's a group of order eight. 
the generating set consists of i, j, k, those three quaternions, and uh, their inverses. So you have six generators at each vertex. That means you have six moves you can do. Uh, and it's just a failing of my perspective drawing that uh, it only looks like five at uh, many of these points. And the eight vertices only look like seven. But hopefully you can see that it's really a cube with eight vertices. And at each vertex, you can either use these orthogonal uh, edges of the cube, or you can do the shortcut across the diagonals of the faces. So those are the six moves. Um, this is not really the way they come up typically because it's a finite group. Uh, in practice, this is more interesting when the group is infinite. So for instance, it could be uh, Z2 with, uh, with two generators, horizontal and vertical translation. And uh, then the Cayley graph is an infinite grid. Uh, so the theorem of Keston, uh, oh, I see a more. We're over by about six minutes. Okay, so uh, the theorem of Keston is that two root P is the best you can do. Um, the edge case of Keston's theorem is when the group is free. That's related to the Banach-Tarski paradox. If you can produce a free group of rotations acting on the sphere, uh, then some very counterintuitive things happen. That's all. And for more information, uh, I certainly recommend the papers of Lubotsky, Philip Sarnak. Um, the key inputs of Deling and Keston uh, are available in these papers. And for more on quaternions, uh, there's a very nice book of uh, John Conway and Derek Smith. Um, yeah, Conway passed away in April from COVID, but some of the things he knew uh, survive in his writings, and I very much endorse them. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any questions for our speaker? Yes. Can we? Go back to the slides that we skipped, please. Ah, <laughs> thank you for the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so can you explain why Keston gives freedom? So there, there was a remark at some point you said uh, on the, well, yeah. So let, let us read this first. Yeah, so Keston proves that uh, on any Cayley graph, on 2L generators, the spectral gaps, at least two square roots, 2L minus one. So in our case, uh, 2L is P plus one. Uh, so it's exactly the two root P that was promised. And uh, the proof is uh, not something I can explain quickly. Uh, the, it's another sort of inductive calculation on the tree to he actually gets to sort of the entire spectrum. It's not just the top eigenvalue, but it's an exact solution for the spectrum of this operator on, on the tree for the free group. Um, and there is kind of a convincing intuition that um, if you believe that this lambda one is related to how quickly things mix. Yeah, it mixes the, the, the fastest for the free group. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clearly having more loops is not going to help things mix. Mm -hmm. So there's there's definitely more to do there, but it's pretty intuitive that the free group is going to be that edge case. Keston also identifies the other edge case. When is it 2L? And, and that's sort of the, I guess, the more famous Keston theorem. Uh, are there questions? Yes, so, uh, <clears throat> is there a formula or is there a way to compose different TPs or TP to the M's? Like, do you know if they 
commute or it just because the notation kind of reminds of hacker operators. Yeah, they uh, they very much are thinking of these as hacker operators. Um, in fact, the title of their paper is Hacker Operators and Distributing Points on the Sphere. Um, I don't know uh, if they commute. I would have to check. It's uh, yeah, I mean, if you compose one with the other, then effectively you're looking at all the quaternions of norm, let's say p times q. So there's definitely some relation there, but I don't know uh, what it is on the nose. In general, if you compose multiple primes together, um, Things stay pretty well distributed, but you start to lose powers of log as you take more and more factors. And another other question in this bound for lambda one. So it the constant implicitly depends on zeta, but I guess that cannot be made explicit since you're using, you're just knowing that it comes from a modular form bound. Is that right? That is right. Um, Yeah, it would be pretty tricky to say anything there because the, yeah, I mean, the polynomial that enters in here is not just u, it's also, you know, u times the norm. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I would think of it as just U is the worst harmonic in the world. It has high degree. It's not part of any special base. Well, it is an eigenfunction of T, so there's that. But uh, yeah, its behavior at an arbitrary point zeta is not something we can really control. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, so these uh, these points, the phillips lubowski saranek points, uh, how do they perform from the point of view of spherical cap discrepancy or various energies, uh, like the Reese energy or some other energies? Uh, about that? I think in general, the answer is good, but not great. OK. It depends on the problem. So in terms of like packing or like being well separated, uh, they're definitely not uh, very close to optimal on that. Um, so I think for like a very sharp energy, they're also not going to be great. But for discrepancy, they are pretty good. Um, yeah, they, they actually prove some bounds on the discrepancy in spherical caps. And that bound is pretty good, and they do some numerical investigations suggesting that the truth is even better. Okay. Uh, so I'll refer to their paper for the actual details. Okay. Um, I should also say that these papers were written in 1986 and 1987 in the intervening 30 or so years. Uh, there could be new results that I'm not aware of. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I have some links if uh, if anyone's interested in addition to the sort of published references. Uh, I can put these in the chat. Okay. Well, in the meanwhile, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. I will also stop the recording now in case there were any questions.